Yo, this is DMC and the place to be and the place for all of y'all to be is deconstructing stigma. Welcome to Mindful Things. I'm your host, Trevor Chamberlain. The Mindful Things podcast is brought to you by the Deconstructing Stigma team at McLean Hospital. Help us change attitudes about mental health by visiting deconstructingstigma.org. Oh, 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 I'm sorry. I didn't, I didn't mean to bump into you. I wasn't paying attention. Hi. What? Two we- It's been two weeks already? Oh my gosh, that flew by. Oh my God. I need more sleep. I'm in my new apartment. I have my cat back with me. I can't tell you, even though I'm about to tell you, I'm about to tell you how great it is to finally have a place of one's own after a year. I mean, the effects were immediate. I was feeling better. I didn't have money right away to to get my meds, so it was a little rough over the weekend, but um, I managed to pick them up the other day. And uh, I'm already feeling better. But yeah, just being in the home, recreational cannabis use down, eating like crap down. Um, That is the thing that I'm looking forward to the most is cooking again. Ah, it's going to be great. On today's episode, we have a gentleman named Robert Oxnum. This was very moving interview for me. I didn't know much about Mr. Oxnum. Um, Other than that, he was a really big deal. Uh, This is from Wikipedia. Let me give you a little background on him. Robert Oxnum was the president of the Asia Society for over a decade, from 81 to 92. The Asia Society, America's leading public education institution on all aspects of the Asia-Pacific region, grew rapidly under his direction to encompass corporate, contemporary, and cultural programs concerning over 30 Asian countries, with a New York headquarters and offices in D.C., Los Angeles, Houston, and Hong Kong. Since the 1990s, Oxnum has often acted as a lecturer for prominent Americans seeking in-depth knowledge of China, including Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, and former President George H.W. Bush and Mrs. Barbara Bush. In 2005, he published his unusual... I have such a problem with that, and you'll hear that in the interview. Unusual. In 2005, he published his unusual memoir of Fractured Mind. In recent years, Oxnum has embarked on an artistic career, making weathered wood sculptures and doing macro lens photography of glacial rocks. That is really cool, in my opinion. That is not Wikipedia saying that. That is me saying it. One of the main reasons Oxnum was here for the interview is that he suffers from DID, and uh, we go into that in detail. Uh, I want to let you guys know about halfway through his interview, there is a, a pretty brutal description of child abuse. And... I think out of all the interviews that I've done so far, it was this moment that I think has bothered me the most. It's brutal. For those of you out there who have uh, triggers when hearing details about child abuse, you know, I'm giving you a warning. You know what? I'm giving anybody a warning. That section of the interview is rough. The next thing I'm going to talk about, uh, I'm going to apologize in advance if I get pretty emotional over this because this news kind of pushed me to my limit regarding the topic of suicide and um, I want to talk about it. Keith Charles Flint, September 17, 1969 to March 4th, 2019, was an English vocalist, dancer, and motorcycle racer. He was a founding member of the electronic dance act, The Prodigy. Starting out as a dancer, he became the frontman of the group and performed on the group's two UK number one singles, Firestarter and Breathe, both released in 1996. Flint was born in Redbridge, London, to Clive and Yvonne Flint. His childhood was described as unhappy, and he feuded with his parents, who parted when he was young. Flint was described as being a bright boy with dyslexia and was disruptive in class. He was expelled from school at the age of 15. Flint then worked as a roofer, and later enthusiastically embraced the acid house scene of the late 1980s. Ugh. This is where it starts to get ugly. Flint had a tattoo across his stomach of the word inflicted, a reference to a lyric in Firestarter. Flint was notoriously difficult on transatlantic flights. On one occasion, he had to be restrained from kicking down the door to the cockpit. Prior to his marriage, Flint suffered from an addiction to prescription painkillers. 
On March 4, 2019, just after 8.10 a.m., Essex police were called to Flint's home in the North End near Great Dunmow, Essex. I'm sorry if I uh, pronounced that incorrectly. They showed up in response to concerns for his welfare. Flint was pronounced dead at the scene, and the police did not treat the death as suspicious. It was later confirmed at an inquest into his death that he had died as a result of hanging. Um, Those that know me well know that I really love music. I love all kinds of music, but my first love is electronic music. Most people, a lot of, not most people, a lot of people, they like to dance to it. Me, I, I just love listening to it. It calms my brain. Sometimes the 4-4 beat or the break beat, it brings order to my thoughts and my brain. It, it gives me a rhythm that I can think to because my own rhythm in my brain is, it's like an Ornette Coleman album. And if anybody has ever heard Free Jazz by Ornette Coleman, you'll understand what I mean. Nothing against that album. You know, but it's insanity. I uh, was in the mid '90s. My good friend Chris, who would later become my DJ partner, uh, he introduced me to Left Field and Global Communications, and from there it was just all downhill. Then I got into Underworld and Prodigy and the Chemical Brothers and Aphex Twin, and then it's been off to the races. Uh, once I graduated college, I actually became a club DJ. I did that on and off for about 13, 14 years. Nowhere big, you know, small little dance clubs in, uh, and, and house parties in the New Hampshire main area, one gig down in Boston. It, it, the club was really cool. It's now closed. And uh, for a short period, we had a little following, and uh, we were lucky. Management, most of the time, let us play what we wanted, and, uh, you know, it was really fun. Electronic music has... It just means a lot to me. And um, where my film career never took off, my hobby, DJing, I, I did well at. And I always tried to make sure it was a hobby. I tried, it had, I needed something, I needed a hobby that I could just enjoy. And that was DJing and electronic music to me. The Prodigy, um, I like The Prodigy. You know, I owned a couple of their albums. I have a couple 12-inch remixes of them. I wasn't really into them, but I will admit that they were a gateway to other electronic acts. And for that, I appreciate that. I mean, I'm, I'm sure, you know, they might not uh, appreciate being referred to as a gateway, but I, I hold them in very, very high regard. And then there's a couple of songs by them that I will always, always love. You know, when The Prodigy started, Keith Flint was hired to as a dancer. And unfortunately, when you need to break into the American markets, at least in the 80s or 90s, rock and roll still ruled. And the concept of needing a front man was necessary and having a face to your band. Well, that's not what electronic music was all about. And the Europeans and the Japanese and, you know, they, they seem to be OK with it. But America, the, the business behind it, or at least it was then, I, I think it's changed a lot now, is that you need somebody to front the group. You need a face. And uh, eventually Keith moved up to vocalist and, uh, you know, did those tracks Firestarter and Breathe, which were big hits for them. I don't know if you knew they were going to go back out on tour this year. They were going to play the Glastonbury Festival. And then Keith killed himself a couple of weeks ago. And I can't get it out of my head. I just can't. I, I don't know why. I mean, there have been other artists who I love, you know, maybe that, that were even closer to me that have killed themselves. But there's something about Keith Flint. Maybe it just crossed a line for me. But I am so broken over this. Listen, I'm getting tired of hearing people in the news, people even around me, that say that suicide is a selfish act. I'm getting really sick of it. First of all, I'm going to placate your ego. You're correct. It is. It it is. I am not going to deny that. Suicide is a selfish act. Okay? Okay. But what a lot of people refuse to understand is that when you're going to commit suicide, imagine you're underwater 
and you're drowning. Okay, if you're drowning, what are you going to do? You're going to struggle to get back above the water so you can breathe. What leads people to suicide is that they're underwater, they're at the point, they've struggled enough, they've thrashed, they've tried to get above the surface, and they can't. And you're about to drown. And it hurts. It hurts a lot. If anybody has held their breath underwater for a really long time, you know that there's a point where you got to get up and breathe, okay? When you're about to commit suicide, you can't get up and breathe. You can't. It's not won't. You can't, okay? And you have three options. Number one is the rare one. Number one is that you grab onto a helping hand. That's if you're lucky enough to have a helping hand. You have people that love you and people that are there for you. That's number one, and that's rare. Number two is that you get out by yourself. You somehow manage to do it. You, you pull yourself out of it. And that is hard. That is so hard. I'm talking from experience. It's really difficult. And the third one is, I don't have a helping hand. I can't get to the surface on my own. This hurts so, so much. What can I do to get the pain to go away? What can I do to stop it? You're right. I'm not thinking about the effect it's going to have on my family. I'm not thinking about the effect that it's going to... Well, that's not true. One thing that pulled me out of it was, I was like, I was going to feed my cat. Really? I mean, really? Oh, that stupid cat has saved my life more than once. But I get it. I, I, yeah, part of me wishes I didn't get it because to understand it, to have been there, to know it, it, it I don't know. It's, it's a part of you goes away and you're never going to get it back. I'm so heartbroken over this folks. There are options. You might not think there are options, but there are. About a year and a half ago, before I moved back from San Diego to the Boston area, I was broke. I mean, poor. All I could do was get enough money to pay my rent, feed my cat, and feed myself, and I didn't have money for anything else. Nothing. I couldn't even afford my meds. And I was in a very, very dark place. I couldn't afford therapy. So with the recommendation of a friend, I called a crisis hotline. Now, it was hard to do that. It's embarrassing. You, you're desperate. And you're going to call this person... And they're going to save my life? I don't know. There, there were probably a few more instances in my life uh, where I uh, should have called a crisis hotline, but I had too much pride. And I know I'm not the only one. It's, it's just embarrassing. And then the process is very difficult. If you're trying to get meds, and understandably so, like I had to go downtown and I had to sit in a room with a lot of people who are in a lot of pain and are in a lot of trouble and aren't, <laughs> they've been dealt a real shit hand. And you go into a room and you get grilled on, yeah, it kind of does feel like a grilling, but I, I do get it. They're going to give me meds for free. I get it. And I got my meds, and it was what I needed to finish the process of packing up and coming home. I get it, folks. There's a lot of you. There might be some of you listening right now that are suicidal, and you don't have any options. 
you feel like you don't have any options. You hear the words crisis hotline and you just turn your back to it. I get it. I totally get it. It sucks. It's a terrible process, but it's one of the only ones. And I promise you it works. It works. I'm living proof of it. It works. So listen to the information I'm about to give you. One group you could call or text are the Samaritans, and that's at 877-870-HOPE or 877-870-4673. Now, you can call or text that number for help. There's also the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. That number is 800-273-8255. That's 800-273-8255. There's a special National Suicide Prevention Lifeline that's in Spanish. That number is 888-628-9454. Again, 888-628-9454. For the deaf and hard of hearing, 800-799-4889. Again, 800-799-4889. Veterans Crisis Line. 800-273-8255. Again, 800-273-8255. Or you can text them at 838-255. Again, text them at 838-255. And finally, disaster distress hotline. Hey, you lose a house in a storm. You know, not just a house. Maybe you you lost a family member and and your house burned down. There's a fire. Maybe you lost a, a pet, you know. That can push people a pretty far distance. The Disaster Distress Hotline, 800-985-5990, 800-985-5990. I am just torn up about the death of Keith Flint. Um, he wasn't well known, but he did something for me in my life that at the time I needed, I needed this music. This music, it does more than bring me joy. It does more than make me want to move my legs and dance. It makes me, it does more than just sit, you know, just calms me down. It helped me discover this whole new art form that I love so dearly. I mean, I love it all. Chill wave, ambient, trance, house, progressive house, like all of it. It just means so much to me. And to hear that one of its pioneers killed himself at 49, just before they were going to embark on a huge worldwide tour. Huge. I mean, I saw the ads on my social media, the people commenting, people were excited. They were going to play Glastonbury. Like, that's no joke. And now Keith Flynn is dead. And I'm so angry about this. And I'm so angry about people talking about how selfish it is. Because it's it's so much more than that. And please, can you just allow it to be complicated? Can you do that? Yeah, you're right. It's selfish. And you're hurting people in the process. And... Maybe you're leaving a kid to fend for themselves. I know it's terrible. It's not good. But people commit suicide. They, they, they just, they don't deserve the damnation for their choice. I'm not asking you to agree with me. I'm just asking you to accept that it's just more complex than any of us know. And until you know, you don't. You don't. Okay. Robert Oxnum. Really good interview. I got a lot out of it. Again, halfway through, kind of a dark area. Proceed with caution. But other than that, I hope you enjoy. And I see from your artwork, and unfortunately the listeners can't see this, but I see a lot of Asian influence. Are you consciously working that into your artwork? 
You know, consciously is a, a funny thing. The more I found out about um, art making, and it's only been a few years that I've been doing it. I've been a sculptor for about 15, 20 years, mm-hmm. but, but works on paper, it's been uh, – only in the last two or three years. I see it in the color palette. Yeah. I see it in, the, in your what, choice of what colors. What you're looking at is also Chinese calligraphic paper, mm-hmm. and which is you know an ancient thing, the Chinese mm-hmm. making of paint and, and grinding of, of ink. Mm-hmm. And so that tradition, yes, that's mm-hmm. that's part of it. Do the colors soak and therefore change? Do they take a different uh, uh, kind of tint when they hit that paper? It, yeah, it's interesting. If you take if you take ink onto a dry calligraphic paper, it will begin to make a little pattern. Mm-hmm. But if you if you wet the area, it will go off and make all kinds of patterns on its own. It's mm-hmm. almost like the calligraphic paper. You go to go, go ahead, make me a beautiful, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, beautiful work of art but it does take some work from the artist but it's it's a remarkable thing does that give you anxiety and, when the color goes on you know, in its own direction you know, one thing i found out about becoming an artist it's true probably of every enterprise but uh that you have to learn to accept your your place in all of this there are absolutely ge- genius, not i there refuse are to genius, accept there, absolutely there are not. geniuses no. who have been there forever no but there are a few people. My like way me. or the highway. Oh <laughs> my God! But you know what I find is you see the finished works here. For each one of them, it's probably one of ten that I, I'm even a little satisfied with. So it's uh, right. Yeah. And if you really get satisfied and arrogant, then you produce bad work. So that's what I tell myself. Yeah. And uh, so, but it's it's been a trip. Uh-huh. And uh, I've worked with an Australian artist for the last year and a half. And he's, uh, his name's David Rankin, now lives in New York. Mm-hmm. Um, but he saw some of my sculpting work and he said, why don't you do works on paper? And so I began to study with him. Mm-hmm. And uh, he is, he's an abstract artist and... Uh, he really set me on a path mm-hmm. and taught me a lot about inks and how to grind inks, but also how to uh, mix inks with water, the right amounts and mm-hmm. all of that. And so it's great to have a, a look. We both met, actually. We both had been separately in uh, accidents, mm-hmm. <laughs> and we were in a uh, therapy place, mm-hmm. and we were right next to each other, and a nurse came in and said, well, the guy next to you is an artist, and mm-hmm. we got talking there, you know, aches and pains and mm-hmm. all that stuff, that, and suddenly it, uh, he loves Chinese art, loves Japanese art, mm-hmm. so we, we had the same thing in mind, and it, it just came alive. What was your, your responsibility for, a, you know, Asia and America? What were your responsibilities between those two? In terms of relationship between yes. Asian countries, I mean, uh, Americans uh, certainly back in that period, and when the Asian Society was founded by John D. Rockefeller III in 1956, mm-hmm. and he was uh, uh, someone with a real vision of what the future ought to be, and because he had gone to Asia a lot. And he was flabbergasted that most Americans knew nothing about it. And if they knew something about it, it had to do with war, like Vietnam. And um, so he gave an impetus for getting underway with uh, Asian art in different places Mm -hmm. from performing arts of Mm -hmm. Asia. And then over time into programs of contemporary interest for, for a larger public on relations between United States and China or mm-hmm. United States and Japan or the emergence of a Pacific community, mm-hmm. all of that. So my responsibility was to oversee that or continue the legacy of, of Mr. Rockefeller mm-hmm. and to bring together a really top-flight staff, which we, which we were able to do in the 1980s and mm-hmm. 1990s, and begin having programs not just in the U.S., uh, not just in New York, but around the U.S., mm-hmm. but more and more programs in Asia itself. Mm-hmm. So, How did that translate? Because there's, there's one thing that I learned is that there's looking at China through a Western point of view, which not always the best way to look at it. You kind of have to adopt to what their point of view is culturally, which is something that you have to communicate as well. 
Were you able to do that? I think so for a lot of people. It, the, some people just came for a program or two, and the, the transformation of their thinking mm-hmm. was was minimal. But for a lot of people, they began uh, in the 1960s, 70s, 80s, began thinking about, okay, let's go on vacation to Asia. Right. Or let's start collecting Asian art if you had that kind of money. Mm-hmm. Um, or – let us set up new business practices around Asia. And so in many ways, the the personal linkage between Asians and Americans uh, began to flourish in that mm-hmm. period. Now, it wasn't the majority of the population. Right. But for a significant minority, it, it was. And I think we played a role in that. Mm-hmm. So I want to move on to something. I I want to bring in your diagnosis of disassociative identity disorder. Do you remember what year it was when you were diagnosed? Yes. What year was that? 1990. 1990. In retrospect, could you see it in yourself? Could other people see it in you leading up to 1990 when you were specifically diagnosed? Can you see that it was always a part Actually, of you? I didn't see it until yeah. 1990 in any kind of precise way. Right. I knew that things... Uh, on the outside, things looked like they were going very well. And Asia Society, I was president uh, until 1991, from 1979 on. And in that period of time, I, I got involved in all of the programs that I had just r- reported to you. Mm-hmm. But in that same period, it's when I began uh, drinking a lot. Mm-hmm. It's a period of time in which I would work hard and then – leave the work day and go to places like Grand Central Station and go off in a corner and just, you know, shake in the corner for an hour or two. Uh, Would you drink? Because I know you can drink in Grand Central. Yeah, I, uh, they, put, they, they put it in a brown paper bag and you can sit there and drink. How do you know this so well? Because you see it all over oh, Grand okay, Central. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and anyway, and yeah. I've done it once. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there are little corners of, of Grand Central Station where you can sit with a bag, mm-hmm. but you're there with a bunch of other guys who are bag men who live there. I mean, know? this may be reaching, but there's all sorts of corners of life where you can go and hide into. I mean, I've done it myself. Absolutely. We've, Absolutely. we've talked about, uh, you know, I told you I have borderline personality disorder, mm-hmm. severe depression. I mean, I can't tell you how many places I've, I've hid and numbed myself with alcohol and drugs and stuff like that. It's... I understand. The only thing I added to that was cigarettes. Oh yeah, I'm oh. back. I'm 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 sorry, boss. Uh, I'm back smoking again after eight years. Yeah, get off it. Mm, I know. Get off. It, it never goes away. The one thing about it is, yes, it does. It does. It just goes away faster for people who smoke. Yeah. That is uh, how many. My father died of lung cancer, so yeah. I, I watched it happen. Somebody, I'm. Very, very close with actually yeah. just found out her last night that her father's diagnosed yeah. lung cancer and went home to him today. It's rough. Well, back, I mean, back to your, your question about when did I know. Uh, I didn't know until I went to a very good therapist. Mm-hmm. Um, did you think you were misdiagnosed at first? Um, at first, at first, I went into uh, it's kind of hard to be president of the Asia Society and then go off for a month and a half to a, to a place called Edge Hill. Mm-hmm. I, I worked for the for six years, and when they found out I was mentally ill, I was considered a a a problem. Did that happen to you? Well, it happened that I was actually stepping down from the Asia Society at the time that the diagnosis had occurred, which would be much much harder to have gone through therapy on a two or three times a week and mm-hmm. keep running an organization that big. Mm-hmm. So, but. Um, I did not know, though, until I was diagnosed, and I didn't even believe it at first, you know, and I, I went running out trying to find books on, on multiple personality. That's what we called it back then. Yeah. And um, I found some, and I read Sybil for the first time, mm-hmm. and, and then I started to see parallels in it. Right. And the only way I could kind of keep things together was to have, instead of having one single job, I had a bunch of jobs. And um, that allowed me – sometimes I had to work, you know, at a very high pace. Other times I got open 
periods. Mm -hmm. And it was in that period of time that I could begin to think about what was really going on. And I had blackouts. There were periods of time which I can't remember anything had happened. One time in, in China, I got drunk and I didn't apparently get up for 24 hours. And when I got up, I can't remember what happened and who was there and why I, 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 I was – even at that particular hotel, I was just losing things from, mm -hmm. from my own memory. Are you a passionate person? Are you generally a passionate person? Yeah. Yeah? I am. Yeah. yeah. And so it, it, for me to kind of back and be isolated, and all, it's, it's almost unthinkable. But then I recognized that there were other things that were going on. And, um, but I'd never fully believed the, the diagnosis for about two or three years. And then at that point, it was, it was evident that this, this was full-scale DID. And at about the same time, it became dissociative identity mm -hmm. disorder. Yes. Yeah. F feel free to not answer this if you don't feel comfortable. But growing up when you were younger, did you feel misunderstood by your parents or people around or teachers or friends? Did you did you feel that people just didn't get you? I think there were there were a number in the 1990s. But growing up, I didn't. I didn't feel that sense of uh, loneliness. There was I was a kind of um, um, super student and wanted to always be number one and all of that. And you, being a super student doesn't require brilliance. What it requires is just enormous amounts of memorization. And it turned out that and dedication that had, and dedication and all of that. So, but. I took it to an extreme. I mean, uh, what? Ex give me okay, an example. Here, here's an extreme. Yep. Here's an extreme. Here we go. Do you know anybody else in college who typed all of their notes? No. 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 Every one of them. If you type, so you all, wrote your notes. If you type all your notes and pick the key themes from books and put them all together and wait until four years go by at a college. You'll, you'll come out with highest honors. Yeah, so it's a mnemonic issue. But people, that, that is strange, don't you think? Uh, hold, hold, hold on. Maybe I would have thought that was strange in college. But now that I'm older, if that was your process to yield the best grade, no, I don't find that strange at all. I really don't. But the question is, are you loving the subject or are you loving the grade? Oh, you're loving – oh, I could have told you you were loving the grade. Okay. Yeah. Good. Absolutely. So, so you, you wrote down your notes, you went home, mm -hmm. and then you, you went through your notes, you figured out what was the best stuff or what's most likely was going to be on the exam, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. And then you typed that up and you filed it in a book for you to look at when mm -hmm. you were studying for that exam. Well, I don't know, sounds smart to me. Yeah. It's kind of wonderfully wacko, don't you think? Uh, I don't know. I wish I'd done it. <laughs> I always, I always didn't take notes and just kind of winged it. But if it, if it was anything besides a film class, I I, well, I did I'll tell not you care. Where that that began to thaw was um, in my graduate school experience because I actually did get to really enjoy Chinese studies mm -hmm. and have wonderful professors. Mm -hmm. This wonderful woman who was thirty three, no thirty seven when I first went to Yale and studied Chinese language, my mm -hmm. very first language teacher, is now 93. Mm -hmm. And she and I talk almost every weekend in mm -hmm. Chinese. Mm -hmm. She's now living in the West Coast. It, and that I saw, I, I enjoyed that experience enormously and it's, li it's left a whole lifetime of, of wonderment. <laughs> when you say Chinese, uh, Mandarin or Cantonese? Mandarin. 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 I don't speak Cantonese. I think I found the quote I was looking for. The DSM-5 elaborates on cultural background as an influence for some presentations of DID. This is what they have to say. Many features of dissociative identity disorder can be influenced by an individual's cultural background. Mm -hmm. Individuals with this disorder may present with prominent medically unexplained neurological symptoms, such as non-epileptic seizures, paralysis, or sensory loss, in cultural settings where such symptoms are common. Similarly, in settings where normative possession is common, rural areas in the developing world, among certain religious groups in the United States and Europe, 
The fragmented identities may take the form of possessing spirits, deities, demons, animals, or mythical figures. A acculturation, a, help me, a cultural, acculturation. acculturation, or prolonged interculture contact may shape the characteristics of <clears throat> other identities. Possession form dissociative identity disorder can be distinguished from one culturally accepted possession states in that the former is involuntary, distressing, uncontrollable, or often recurrent or persistent. I think, um, I think one could get overstated. Yeah, with I, the whole, I think that's a bit overstated. cultural approach to yeah. it. Uh, yes, of course. Obviously, this, uh, this continuum that you have in generation to generation, things passed down. It wasn't that which really kicked off DID in mm -hmm. my experience. I had to wait almost 50 years mm -hmm. to find out what had actually happened in the first five years mm -hmm. of my life. But it became apparent in through sessions with, psychiat with my psychiatrist that indeed there had been um, a huge amount of violence uh, aimed at me during the early years. And that's not cultural. That is what, physical violence. Uh, what years specifically? between ages one and five, but the memory comes back. It's, it was the driving force, I think, in much of what you were talking about earlier. Mm. Um, the Grand Central Station mm -hmm. stuff has, it, has its roots in a period in, in which there was enormous violence. I, I grew up and I found out that there are many others or some others that come from the World War II generation. That is, they were born during the war. Fathers were actually away other parts of the family became involved in taking care of the kid. If there was anybody who was absolutely cruel in that group, it could be um, visited upon the child. And it happened to me. And it was the things that came back through therapy, these, these had all been kind of scrambled memories. And then a therapist can help put it into shapes and boxes that, that make sense. The, the original thing was a horror house. It was, um, and I, I, I have vowed that I won't express the names of those who no, did no, it. No, 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 But, uh, and I didn't even in the book, but. Um, Which we'll get to. We'll get to the book. The violence, it's even kind of hard to talk about now. The violence uh, began with um, beatings. And beatings that occurred fairly regularly, and it was my job to go out and cut the bush. You had that to cut. Was be you had to cut the switch. I had to cut the switch. What I didn't know then to be, but I, it was obvious later, was uh, penetration sex when I it was probably two and three years old. Mm -hmm. um, I remember at least once or twice being held up over boiling water and told that I was going to be dropped in the water and I went screaming. Um, the one that actually is the most memorable and gives me enormous claustrophobia is that it was exactly that period in the early 40s when people were shifting from old ice boxes to, to electric refrigerators. And uh, we everybody put the uh, old icebox out on the street. Icebox was big enough and it had uh, doors in it. I was put in the icebox. It wasn't cold. It was just no air and shut. I don't know how long I was in there. I screamed and yelled and all of that. And finally, I, I, somebody opened it. I don't remember the, the person who did it. But this is just bloody torture. And torture happens in a lot of societies, and it's not just our own, but it's kind of rampant, and it's often hidden. And in some ways, uh, DID is a very creative response to this. You can, my sense about the origin of DID in my own sense is that it begins very early in life and is often children who have fairly high uh, intellectual attainment, but more, more than that, who have a kind of resilience, who say, okay, you're told that this is going to happen, that this has happened to you because you're a bad boy. And that's just drilled into you. And you, one part of you just gets crushed. If there's another part that says, 
I'm not going to put up with this, that I'm not all bad. I, and you create a personality that is a good person who you can believe in, who has hope. And the two of them have to work their way through through life. But it begins right there in childhood. And it continues out of that. And the whole tree of different identities that is DID, I think, emerges from those very early moments and how you respond to it before the child can even say the word respond. But the child recognizes that to stay alive mentally, they're going to have to create someone else. You bifurcate it, and you, you've had the first step towards dissociative identity disorder. That's what happened to me. I know that I, when I read books about, um, about DID or people who've um, suffered from it over years, that's always a theme in it, that they're, when did it actually happen? Why did it actually happen? I know why it happened. You know, Robert, I, this isn't meant to be hyperbole, but that might be one of the most self-aware things I've ever heard anybody say. I mean, how long did it take you to realize all of that? 50 years. 50 years. It was all bubbling down under the surface. And, you know, that the, the drive was to try to prove myself. Mm -hmm. So that's why I memorized all that. I was about to say a bad word, but all that stuff. Oh, you can say it. It's fine. <laughs> um, I say he can say it. It's oh, fine. Okay. okay. <laughs> but the other, the other side of it is the desire to excel has been just so all-consuming. I wanted to prove I'm not that. So what do I do? I, my father said, you know, he used to teach firearms during the war. He, he said he didn't want to get near a firearm again, but introduced me to archery. Of course, I couldn't be happy with archery, so mm -hmm. I became, uh, I won the club contest. I won the state contest. I became national archery champion. And all of this had to happen, not because I loved it, but because I had to prove it. And that's not the way one should sport, approach academic work or sports, in my mind. So uh, with all the accomplishments you've had, and you have qu quite a few, how do you reckon with those accomplishments? How, how do you not write them off as as byproducts of your disorder instead of accomplishments. That's something that I'm going through right now. I'm going through all my life accomplishments and I am now, and it's a, it's a, right now I'm in a really strange place where all my accomplishments, what accomplishments I've had, they're all tainted by, this is a byproduct of my mental illness. Obviously I'm not giving myself any credit. You're right not to give yourself credit, and then you're wrong not to give yourself credit. Right. And both both are right. Right. That 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 obviously you have the skills there to do that, and you should be proud of it. But if it occurs for you as it did for me, then it's a kind of lonely way of mm -hmm. going off into a place of saying, "I'm going to prove myself so that other people know." Mm -hmm. and, no, it definitely you know, came that, out. It sick. definitely came from a negative place. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And yours did too, is what I'm hearing. Absolutely. The darkness of all of it. I mean, I remember one time, um, of course, I got a Phi Beta Kappa key. Of course, my grandfather had a Phi Beta Kappa key that he gave to me. And one night I got drunk and I threw both of them in the ocean. And that's how I feel. I, I still feel that was the right thing to do because maybe my grandfather didn't deserve that, but I did. Because I, I was only there because it was a kind of stamp of mm -hmm. approval. Did, was, you do, did you do any self-harming, cutting, anything like that? Um, not really cutting. Yeah. I did a lot of banging my head on the wall mm -hmm. or beating myself up Choking physically. yourself? Not choking. Um, some reason I was – choking was off limits. I don't mm -hmm. know why. But, but, but physical mm -hmm. uh, pain that I, uh, that I went through and that I, that I caused myself was – sort of a daily practice in the 1980s. The other side of it was coming back from the Asian society, then get drunk, then engage in these things. Did drinking numb it or does drinking make you feel it more? For me, I drank to make it to make myself feel worse, to make myself feel the pain even more. Alcohol makes me more emotional, which is mm -hmm. a nightmare. 
And that's why I don't drink that much anymore. But that's why I did it. Mm -hmm. I drank to feel, to just to make it feel so much worse. I didn't do it to uh, make myself feel so much worse. I did it as a kind of anesthesia, you know, that I would start drinking, you know, after after dinner and then drink till 11 o'clock or 12 o'clock or whenever I passed out. Did it ever start before dinner? Uh, very seldom, very seldom because I had that whole other side of me, another personality. So you had a I'd schedule. Show. Yeah, yeah. Oh, absolutely. And you stuck to it. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I so you got your responsibilities done. I joined the Century done. Club in right. New York, the Century Club, because it made the uh, the, the biggest drinks in town. Mm -hmm. I mean, so it's probably three times the average drink, which I'd have three of, and that that would take care of it. Do you feel at the level that you were operating, the society that you were around? Do you feel that that behavior was enabled? Uh, you know what I felt was that. The, the the pressure, I, I, that's what I always say. It's the pressure that I've got to let, let off. But I think in, 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 a, in a deeper sense, it was before I even knew that I had all of these different parts, it was feeding a dark side and a, and a light side and trying at least to, you know, stay stable, which you can't. And ultimately, you, you either take your own life, which I tried twice, so you've made suicide attempts. I, I made suicide attempts, one of which was a serious one. Yeah? How serious? A serious enough to uh, have my wife come home and I was unconscious because I'd taken um, a whole bunch of pills and uh, they had to rush me to the hospital and uh, cleared my stomach and then I was okay. This, by the way, occurred um, in the 1970s. So, it, I mean, in the 1990s, it, well after I'd been diagnosed. So that, 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 was, that was one. Others, I thought of jumping out the window, but I decided not to. Mm -hmm. Got the foot halfway across. I'm, I'm sorry, where, where's your wife again? Is she? Oh, she's, well, not here. she's not here. Yeah. Oh, okay. She's not here. She's not here. I should have explained. She, she, I, I should explain. <laughs> my wife is also my savior oh, in I all thought, this. I thought she was here. I'm sorry. No, she's not. I should mention something. <laughs> since sure, she, since go she's ahead. A, uh, Vishaka Desai, um, whom I, who was actually on the staff of the Asia Society, but, so we didn't start dating until I left uh, left the position in the mm -hmm. early early 1990s. And she became president eventually of the she Asia Society. She did become uh, presidential uh, president of the Asia Society, and she is the ultimate answer in uh, my recovery. Um, How so? You almost. As I, I've looked at so many DIDs uh, that the other person doesn't get enough credit mm -hmm. because if you have a partner where it really works, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's an, an extraordinarily helpful mm -hmm. pattern and understands what, you, what you're going through. Do you feel that you deserve her in, her life, in your life or uh, no? I, I lucked out. You <laughs> lucked out? Yeah, but, she, do you, but do you ever feel like... Uh, sometimes I, I feel like I, I, the burden I place on her is too much. Mm -hmm. and, and do you feel? Do you specifically feel undeserving of it? Yeah, sometimes, sometimes. Yeah. But she is also... Uh, she's a very successful person. She's the chief advisor to Lee Bollinger at Columbia University president. Uh, mm -hmm. on all of the global program. She goes around the world all the time. Mm -hmm. Good news is she collects a lot of uh, extra flight ticket time. So oh, that's nice. I, I fly with her sometimes. Oh, Doggone. Yeah. very we nice. We had to go to Greece this year, you know, that, that kind of thing. Uh, but her name is, is uh, Vishaka Desai. Mm -hmm. She's Indian. Mm -hmm. And that's the other thing that's great. I didn't know that you could have really large families that loved each other, that didn't hate each other. Yeah. I'd grown up with that. Yeah. And her family, she's one of seven, mm -hmm. and it's such a treat to go yeah. off to Indy with them. And, and they, they embraced me from the very beginning. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's an extended family where, yeah, they go through all kinds of troubles. But the hatred and the nastiness, I couldn't believe it. Not there. Yeah. Zilch. In your uh, Wikipedia page, there's this sentence here that I find so strange. 
and indicative of the problem that we have discussing mental illness in general. This line stood out for me. It says, in 2005, he published his unusual memoir, A Fractured Mind. About the, mm -hmm. uh, the book. Why would it be described as unusual? I think that that still is in the public imagination. It's a public way of looking at DID. Anybody who has DID uh, knows that uh, – curious, what was the word? Unusual. Unusual. Um, it's – in fact, we're, we're used to being looked at in a way that people mm -hmm. may smile in front of you but sometimes, you know, make mm -hmm. comments behind your back and uh, – uh, They couldn't so use the word it, honest or compassionate. They had to use unusual. And it can also be that a male – person with DID uh, going public. There, there haven't been a lot of books. There are more uh, female from Sybil on. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe it was partly that. It Did may you? have been that it was professional suicide in the China uh, studies world. Mm -hmm. I knew that. But I've had friends who were mm – -hmm. We, we did books together and all sorts of – who won't talk to me again. And Do you so, feel that releasing a fractured mind – by putting that out there, because there seems to be a gender disparity, at least at that time, discussing DID, did you feel that it was a threat to your masculinity or your manhood? No. No. I, I did it in a very thoughtful way. Vishak and I approached it in a very thoughtful way. We knew we were going to take some hits in it. But I thought that it was important to have you know someone who had this particular kind of background but suffered from DID to just tell the story. Mm -hmm. And, and in the course of it, I had a very good friend uh, who passed away a few years ago. Oh, I'm sorry. He, as I was writing the book, said, you know, you ought to let each of the identities speak for themselves. And it was a game changer in that most books about DID uh, have been told somewhat objectively or told mm -hmm. – as if there was all, always the, the narrator was always the uh, same person. Mm -hmm. And by letting Bobby and Tommy and, and Wanda and all have their own voices in it made it much more like at least how I've experienced DID in my own mind. Mm -hmm. So you could take a trip mm -hmm. almost literally along with me by reading the book. And so that's – that's why I think it may have been described as unusual, mm -hmm. partly as a compliment. Mm -hmm. I'd like to take it that way. Mm. Uh, and you've lost, since coming out with your diagnosis, it, you've said you've lost friends. Or uh, I have lost friends. Um, but, you know, the interesting thing is nobody really close to me or my wife or her family has backed away. But there are people who are sort of you know, on the exterior of my life with whom I've written articles or that sort of uh, mm -hmm. attended conferences together and thought we were friends. Um, some of them just closed down altogether, mm -hmm. won't talk. I've seen them in rooms uh, that I walk through. I say hi. There's no response. So I think it's – No response. No response, just other than just looking away, which is, by the way, uh, you know, a, a hard thing to put up with when you've – spent so much time together. But I, I do understand it. I think that a lot of people live in a very old world in which DID uh, is still thought of as MPD, multiple personality disorder, which is seen as a horrible thing. How can anybody be successful if you've gone through all of this? And my own story is why you can do that. Mm -hmm. uh, but they didn't obviously get into the story itself. The, the former pr former president of the Asia Society, late uh, uh, president of the, of the Asia Society, one day he and I were took a subway ride. The book had just come out, and he said, "I don't believe any of it. I never saw any of it." Mm -hmm. And I think, wait a minute, you think so everybody with DID walks into yeah. every professional right. association? No, and I've had people. Hi, I right. have DID, yeah. and and. And I've had people very close to me when I finally tell them that I have BPD. They, they say, no. I've had somebody yeah. say, no, you don't. Yeah. Okay. I mean, you just have to put up with that. Yeah. And, and it's, I have uh, to put up with it for yeah. the rest of my life? Yeah. You, have to, you, have to, you know what you have to do for the rest of your life is find other people who have shared the same experience. And then you can just sort of collectively say, 
Forget it. Robert, what if I don't like people? You got to work on that part. <laughs> like, you got to work. work on that, that part, that's too. That's another show. Uh, <laughs> I'll have you back for that show. How do, I, how do I learn to like people? You know, I actually think a lot of people with DID could be therapists if they wanted to because we've all gone through an experience, mm -hmm. which is that's why we bond with mm -hmm. her. That's why McLean is so great. Mm -hmm. It's uh, because we can all be on the same wavelength. Yeah, I could be a therapist if I wasn't too busy being my own therapist 24 hours a day. So I have one client and it's you know, me. You know you can do both. I can? Yeah, you can. You <laughs> that can. sounds exhausting. <laughs> it's exhausting, but I know a lot of people who are in that business. <laughs> so let's talk about art now. Mm. When did you make the transition into artist? You know, it's funny that I made the transition into sculptor mm -hmm. um, in the 1990s after I'd left the Asia Society. Mm -hmm. And it was simply because of the fact that uh, we have a place on the North Fork of Long Island mm -hmm. and, and it's on the water. I went down after a, um, a storm had come through. I saw this nice little piece of wood down there. Mm -hmm. And so I took it back, and I like to fiddle with things, so I smoothed it out and all of this. And then I went to the hardware store and said, what kind of paint should I use on this? And the guy looked at me and said, you know what about milk paint? And I said, I didn't know anything about milk paint. And he taught me that th this paint actually is what, you, when you go to any place in New England and you see the red barns, mm -hmm. milk paint. It's what the farmers used to use, milk, lime, and a pigment. And so they now package it. So I did that wow. in black, huh. and I shined it up. And then I used natural uh, uh, beeswax and, and rubbed it all up, shined even more. Mm -hmm. And people started coming in and saying, oh, you're an artist. I said, no, I just did this piece. But it got me on a track where I did a several – I must have done 100, 110 – sculptures over the next 10 years. And I ended up saying to myself that, but it's only a sculptor. I haven't really become an artist. And so if you only have, you know, it's kind of Johnny one note. <laughs> so I decided with my Australian friend to go into actually trying to be a multifaceted artist. And it, uh, it's been a wonderful experience because now I can kind of feel I own it. I've had a number of exhibitions, and uh, it's always wonderful to have all these people come together, and nobody says anything negative about, about your art right to your face. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's a kind of warm family thing. So I'll send I, you a few people that will say negative things about your art to your face. <laughs> right to my face. Yeah, well, if they're you, out there. If you could hold them back, that would be, it would wreck my <laughs> yeah, whole self-image. Uh, yeah, know. they're not good for your self-esteem, let me tell you. But anyway, it, it came out of that. And, and but more deeply, I think that the arts are perhaps one of the most important dimensions in handling dissociative identity disorder. And I think of probably a lot of other disorders as well. But what it demands, if you're going to do it right, is that you go through an inner process in which you're not literally saying, but figuratively saying, let me draw on the fact that I have five figures operating on the inside of me. How can we collaborate and do something and actually be able to utilize that in a creative way mm -hmm. it's 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 kind of a it's a miracle mm -hmm. and the beautiful thing about it is i've come up by the way i found out that shrinks just love long words so i developed long words to impress people in the field hit me okay so people talk about multiplicity right so, but I have collaborative multiplicity is it, i mean that that was that was back about ten years ago in my in my evolution. How polysyllabic of you. Yeah, thank you so much. It is very polysyllabic. <laughs> uh, and you meant that? Sincerely. So, oh, I got it. <laughs> so, and then I found out that collaborative is kind of good, but it's like sort of sitting around a fire or something and one person has an idea. It goes, it's very slow. Mm. And so I found out that art is something you don't do art 
slow. You don't go, okay, let me do black here and let me use the large brush here. And mm-hmm. then you don't, it, that's not going to produce a good piece. Mm-hmm. You have to find a way in which that flow comes together. And in that sense, I came up, okay, you, you're, um, you're ready for the next one, right? Mm-hmm. Cohesive multiplicity. Now, I think that is what? How many different? Uh, that, that's uh, eight, right? Eight. Okay. And, but I found that, that once you try to think of putting a brush to paper, you need an idea, you need to have worked your way into that, and then you need to let it flow. And you need every one of those cylinders firing in order to make it work really well. So what I'm hearing and what I like yeah. to hear is that it doesn't sound like to me your message or the statement that you need to make is the burning reason behind your art. Mm-mm. I find that there are so-called artists out there who have something to say mm-hmm. and they use an art form as an avenue to say it. And mm-hmm. while that's legitimate art, mm-hmm. I feel like the craft or the process of the art gets neglected. It sounds like you're more caught up in your process as an artist. That's what I heard. I heard process right there. I agree with everything you said except one thing. Okay. It's our process. It's not my process. Explain that. You have to open it up and say that you are multiple. You have all of these elements. You have that history. The multiplicity became understandable later on. But the question is, how can you take all of these figures, not all of whom are easy characters to deal with, and find a way in which there's a common cause. If you can do that, uh, and and on a very good day, maybe once a month, two times a month, you hit one of those days where it just happens and you're not thinking about DID. Mm -hmm. You're not thinking about trying to show show off to somebody else. You're not overthinking the way in which you use various colors in the palette. Mm -hmm. What you're doing is just letting it roll. And when that happens, it means all of the cylinders are firing. Mm -hmm. And so it's it's our recognition that – and I'm not alone. There may have been a lot of people I know who are DIDs who have uh, found those ways, lots of different things that they can do, uh, but often in creative arts. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that that's that's a lesson – Mm-hmm. that maybe is good for people who see themselves as what we pompously, we DID is pompously call them singletons mm-hmm. and with a little sneer. Mm-hmm. And we, there's a lesson we have here that for people who see themselves not as multiples, actually have multiple po- potential within them if indeed they know how to tap it. I'm going to be awake all night thinking about this. Just keep, I mean, it, it's a thought for anybody who believes that we're all singular or the, that you, if, if you have three manifestations of God, as you know, uh, if, you have, uh, if you have only that the kind of surface way of, of putting things together, that uh, people who go through life and say, I'm not going to explore the inside of my mind. Mm-hmm. Uh, because I know what I'm doing. Every year I'm invited up to, I am, by the way, a, a, a really mediocre musician. Never listen to my work. It's awful. Even, never listen to all of our work together. We're awful. What we, kind of music we, is we, it? We suck. It's, it's classical music. Uh, I've had some of the greatest teachers in the world. They all love talking to me. None of them enjoyed hearing from me. Uh-huh. So anyway, I, I've, I've always aspired to this. But if one sees himself or herself as a singleton and you start saying to yourself, I can explore these other areas. There's dynamite out there. So I am invited back every year to a um, retreat in Madomic, Maine, two-week trip. And and I'm invited to come and talk to all these great musicians who are learning from uh, Ken Kiesler, who is uh, just dynamite conducting. I know uh, that name. You know Ken? Yeah. yeah. He's a dear friend of mine. And he, inv- and he read my book. And he said, you've got to come up and talk to my aspiring conductors. Mm-hmm. 
And so I went up, and I've been going up for the last 10 years, and I talk about the creativity that comes from acknowledging your own multiplicity. You don't have to have DID to recognize that you have separate talents, that you have separate identity spots in your but You don't always deal the same way with your mother that you do with, with professionals in the mm-hmm. – I mean, we have different ways of, of conveying things. And yet we block out the notion that we might have different parts that you could let go. And I think most artists that I know that really make it big, one way or another, have had that moment Mm -hmm. in which they let it go. Mm. And that letting of go, it means you don't have to have total control in one place over, um, over your brain, over your body. And... The energy that comes out of that is just fantastic. Have you so let, have you let go? You know, it. it I'm I'm better at writing about letting go, than <laughs> letting go actually. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I, after I came up with that notion of cohesive multiplicity, I realized that it wasn't just a lot of different identities up here. It was a question of sharpening the pencil. That is saying that they all had a place to fit, in in that one point. So it's more like a, you think of it like a cone. You have these, these different ideas here, identities here, and they can all focus on one thing and they can all contribute to it. That's a very humane thing to do to your own brain, but it's also a very creative way to think about the arts in general. Well, I could, I was thinking while you were explaining cohesive multiplicity, how it would be hard but just try to integrate that outlook into my own life, if only that that would help me see myself as a complex person. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of my problem is, is that if I see myself in, in, in a singular way or as a simpleton, and that makes it really easy. I said easy. singleton. Not singleton? singleton? Yeah, singleton is different than <laughs> okay. simpleton. Yeah. Singleton. Um, it's really easy for me to write myself off that way or to have a negative outlook on myself. However, if I see myself uh, in multiple ways, I can maybe see that I'm more of a complex person than what I'm dismissing myself as. Does that make any sense? Well, I mean, you have the same look that I get from all of these rising conductors. You know, what the hell? He's asking cohesive multiplicity. (laughs) But by the end of a talk or two, what happens is that many of them uh, go back in one way or another. One one did it by creating a mapping mm-hmm. experiment, mm-hmm. and where said I never thought that maybe you know these different parts of me all had were sort of potential uh, identities. Mm-hmm. And what would it mean if I actually tried to do my practice on the clarinet or my practice on the cello uh, in a different way? Mm-hmm. In a different uh, way of looking at it, mm-hmm. and Ken Kiesler said, "You guys here want to be conductors. You want to conduct the whole orchestra. Mm-hmm. Your job is to almost become people with DID. Mm-hmm. You've got all of those forces. Except your job is to make it work, mm-hmm. and you make it work in a in a way that produces energy and beauty, and actually makes." Everybody has heard Beethoven's Fifth. Mm-hmm. If it becomes boring, unless you bring something new, a new kind of energy, a new kind of insight, and so forth. So I, I just think that there there are ways in which we, uh, who are DIDs, have something to offer people who mm-hmm. are uh, singletons. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Before we wrap up, Robert, is there anything that you want to promote or plug or anything? Anything new that you have out or... No, you know, I've gotten to the point. Yes, if anybody wants to buy my paintings, you can give me a call. But I, uh, no, it, it's not that at all. What what I would like to plug is that there uh, there is here at, at McLean uh, just an enormous wealth of information and research that's going on about uh, uh, going on about dissociative identity disorder, among many many other things. But this is the premier place in the country. And I hear it not just when I'm on the campus here. I hear it elsewhere. Oh, you're going to McLean, huh? Um, and I think th- that there are ways in which 
one can either come here or come with guidance from people here or um, simply to look for the best psychiatrist and recognize that the problem we're talking about here is so much more widespread than one would think. The incidence, according to the American Psychi uh, Psychiatric Association, is um, incidence of DID is someplace between 1% and 3% of the United States of America. Take the median there, and you would have, a, if you had all the people in the country uh, in Maryland, they would there would be only DIDs mm -hmm. or Wisconsin. They both mm -hmm. are roughly the same size. We have to learn a lot about opening mm -hmm. ourselves to the problems that have occurred in modern society, and of which uh, identity disorders is a is a major part. Mm -hmm. We need to learn that children are sometimes not performing well enough because of things that have happened to them or because of problems they've had with family. or, And that ought to be a much more open part of life. It's the hardest part to open. But once you do open it, you're doing one of the most humane things you can imagine. How many years do we have on the planet? How do you use that time best? Partly it is understanding yourself. Mm -hmm. Robert, this was an amazing talk. This was really, it was really emotional for me too. I learned a lot. I enjoyed it. Me too. Yeah. I can't. I want to do yeah. it again. You, oh my god! If you ever come back? Yeah, I'd be glad to come back. That'd be Anytime. great. We'll do the two hundred one course. Yeah, <laughs> that'd be great, Robert. Thank you so much for coming. I really thank appreciate you. My it. My pleasure. Thank you. All right. What'd you think of that, huh? Google Robert. Check out his artwork. It's really good. It really is. And I'm just saying that because I had the guy in here, and you know. We're going to be best friends forever. I don't know. I'd like to be friends with him. He's a really cool guy. I love his artwork. And uh, take a moment to check it out. Uh, I'm going to wrap it up real quick. Kind of had a long intro. I'm going to spare you guys. But uh, we'll be back in two weeks. Two weeks. And uh, I hope to see you all. Hear you all? See you all? I don't know. Just come back. Love you guys. Oh, and you know what? I, I mean that. I I don't know you, but I love you. There's nothing wrong with saying it. Some people don't have love. Here, take some of mine. Take some. If it's going to help you get through another crappy day, here. So, when I say that I love you guys, I mean it. I really do. And take care of yourselves please. Okay, two weeks. Thank you for listening to Mindful Things, the official podcast of McLean Hospital. Please subscribe to us and rate us on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. If you have any suggestions for special topics or future guests, email us at mindfulthings at mclean.org. And don't forget, mental health is everyone's responsibility. If you or a loved one are in crisis, the Samaritans are available 24 hours a day at 877-870-4673. Again, that's 877-870-4673.